Gemara gives us two stories, two storylines about the base of Migdash, the destruction of the second temple. One of the stories is very well known. The second part of it isn't well known. But if you think about both parts, they're extraordinarily difficult to understand. Let's begin with the basic story. It was towards the very end of the second base of Migdash, and there was a gentleman who made a party, and he sends his shamash, he sends out his messenger to invite his best friend. His best friend's name was Kamsa. Marshal explains this Kamsa had a son, Bar Kamsa. Apparently the shliach made a mistake. The messenger assumed that the host who was making the party wanted to make peace with his enemy, Bar Kamsa. So not only did he invite Kamsa, the best friend of this man, he invited his son, the sworn enemy of this man. And at the party, this man sees none other than Bar Kamsa. And he walks over to him and says, since you are my enemy, what are you doing here? And Bar Kamsa quickly realizes that he was not exactly invited. And he says, it was a mistake. Please let me stay anyway. No, you're my enemy. I'll pay for all my food. No, I'll pay for half of the party. No, I'll pay for the entire cost of the party. Absolutely not. The man grabs Bar Kamsa by the shirt, picks him up physically, throws him out of the party. The man says, hold the Yasef Be'er Rabbanan, since the rabbis were sitting there, and they watched, and they saw, and they didn't say anything, obviously they think it's appropriate. They feel that I should have been thrown out. They feel this embarrassment is coming to me. I'm going to make kurtza b'malchus, I'm going to create a civil issue. He goes to the Caesar with the idea of causing the Caesar to wage war against the Jews. Now you have to understand, at this point, <clears throat> we're still autonomous in the sense that we're independent. We're in Israel, the base of Mikdash is functioning, but the Romans really are in charge. But they still gave the Jewish nation the rights to practice as we wanted. But it was conditional. This Bar Kamsa shows up to the Caesar and says, Mardi Bachi who died, the Jews are rebelling. And the Caesar says, and how do you know? The man says, I'll prove it to you. Go send the carbon. It was a known fact that whenever the Roman government, in fact, any Gentile who would want to bring a sacrifice who was allowed to be brought in the base of Migdash, especially a leader of people, send a sacrifice, see if they bring it. So in fact, the Gemara tells us that this, Rome, this <coughs> Caesar selected a very fine carbon, a very fine animal, sent it along with Bar Kamsa. Along the way, Bar Kamsa made a blemish, put a nick in the lip, in a manner that for the Jewish people is a blemish, in a manner that for the Gentiles it wasn't. And this animal <coughs> is brought by Bar Kamsa to the base of Migdash. Now the Kohenim there realized that this was a very serious issue because it was an animal being sent by the Roman authority, by the Caesar himself, but it had a mum, it had a blemish, you can't bring it. So they didn't know what to do. So immediately they convened the Sanhedrin. And in the Sanhedrin, the following discussion began. What's the question? Of course you can bring an animal with a mum in this circumstance because it's Sakonis Nefashas. Zechariah Baravukalus happened to have been the God Lador, and he said, no, you can't do that. People are going to learn. People are going to make a mistake. They're going to say that you could bring a mummed cor carbon. They're going to say that you could bring an animal with a blemish on it. They'll learn for generations. It's not worth it. We can't do it. At which point, <clears throat> the consensus said, okay, so kill him. He's obviously trying to cause the Romans to wage war with the Jewish people. It's clearly a life-threatening situation. It's obvious we should kill him. Says Rabbi Zechariah ben Amunkalus, no, we can't do that either. If we kill him, people are going to say that if you make a mum, if you make a blemish in a carbon, in a, <clears throat> in a sacrifice, you're killed. They're going to make a mistake for generations. Says Rabbi Yochanan, because of the humility of Rabbi Zechariah ben Amunkalus, Hichre Evz Beisenu, the base of Mikdash, was destroyed because they didn't bring that carbon. And very quickly, the message was brought back to the Caesar that the Jews, in fact, didn't bring it. He took it as a sign, in fact, that they had rebelled. He launched a major campaign against the Jews. They <clears throat> destroyed the base of Mikdash, killing some one million people immediately, taking the rest into slavery, 
And we still today sit here. And the Gemara's conclusion, but listen to the words that the Gemara concludes with. Come see how powerful is the force of embarrassment. Look how powerful it is. Look how dangerous it is to embarrass another Jew. Because Hashem helped Bar Kamsa. The Hichriv is based over Sarah Fesachalo, and Hashem burnt down the base of Mikdash because of the embarrassment to Bar Kamsa. So let's stop. <clears throat> and let's stop with the first question. If I ask you why was the base of Mikdash destroyed? The answer is Sinaschinam, baseless hatred. If I ask you from this Gemara why was it destroyed? I guess the answer is because uh, Bar Kamsa. But if I ask you from this Gemara, why was the base of Migdash destroyed? You'll say because Rabbi Zechariah ben Avukalus acted too humbly. He should have allowed them either to bring the carbon or to kill him. So what was the reason? The Gemara clearly told us there were two reasons right here. <clears throat> One, because Bar Kamsa tried to create a rebellion. Two, <clears throat> because Rabbi Zechariah was too humble. But we know both reasons aren't correct. The Gemara Numa tells us the reason that the second base of Migdash was destroyed had nothing to do with these events. It had strictly to do with one issue that we had, and that's regard to one another, how we act to friends, baseless hatred. So the first question is, <clears throat> what does this Gemara mean? Blaming Reb Zechariah, blaming this Bar Kamsa, who's to blame? But the second question, <clears throat> I believe, is a bit more profound. And that is, let's imagine the following. Let's imagine what it's like to be this Bar Kamsa at this party. He's invited to the <clears throat> party of who he thought was his enemy. Clearly, the man wants to make peace. And the man comes over to him in front of everyone and says, get out of here. Now, I have to imagine it was hugely embarrassing. I have to imagine it was tremendously embarrassing. He begs, please let me stay. I'll pay for my meal. I'll pay for half the party. I'll pay for the whole party. And in front of, the, I guess, must have been <clears throat> the elite of the elite because the Rabbanim were there. It must have been quite a large contingency, quite a large group. In front of everyone he was thrown out, I have to imagine the embarrassment was very, very powerful. However, I don't think the punishment fits the crime. The Gemara says, look at the power of Busha. Look how damaging it is that Hashem helped Bar Kamsa, and because it has destroyed the base of Mikdash. Now, gentlemen, if I embarrassed you in public, and you got up and punched me in the jaw, we would have a discussion. Hey, you got to learn a little anger management. Maybe I should have, maybe I shouldn't have, but come on, it's a little carried away. But if I embarrass you in public and you burn down my house, that's beyond carried away. That's not what we're talking about over here. <clears throat> what the Gemara is saying is because of the embarrassment of this one individual, Hashem destroyed the base of Mikdash. Do you understand what the base of Mikdash is? We don't because unfortunately we're like that kid born in the pit without ever seeing light his entire life. So he doesn't even know what... The sun rises, he doesn't understand purple or yellow or red because he's never seen light. Would you like to know what the base of Mikdash is? A tiny illustration. Now, Anshe Knesset Agdola used to daven. The people who were members of the Holy Sanhedrin used to daven three hour Shemun Esrei. One hour preparing, one hour davening, and an hour after. Three times a day. Nine hours a day, these people davened. An hour preparing, an hour praying, an hour afterwards. And Nefesh Chaim asks a question. I get it. These men were very pious, very holy. I even understand why they prepared for an hour. If I knew that I'm going to speak to a God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that it contains, and I have an opportunity to beg, to ask, you'd imagine I'd prepare myself. So the hour before, I get it. The hour during, I get it. There's a lot to ask for. But what's the hour afterwards? What do they have to wait an hour for? What's that about? Says the Nefesh Chaim, do you understand what dvekas means? It was as if they left this earth <clears throat> and were clinging to Hashem, and it was such a sublime, such a joyful experience that the thought of coming back to this mundane physical world was so hard on them that they didn't want to do it. It took them an hour an hour to come away from that high, an hour to come back to this sluggish, slow, thick world that we live in. Gentlemen, three times a year, every one of us should be in the base of Mikdash, 
should be experiencing Hashem with absolute clarity, with total, not, not like, Hashem, are you here? Hashem, can you hear me? Hashem, are you, is Hashem really, why? is Hashem, I, I, I don't get, feeling it, seeing it right here, every one of us, that was the base of Mikdash. And you're telling me that for this one guy's honor, for his embarrassment, Hashem burns it down? <laughs> but if you don't get this question, who is this guy? He's not the tzaddik of the generation. He got embarrassed, so what does he do? I'm going to destroy my nation. I'm going to turn against my own people. I'm going to turn Benedict Arnold, and I'm going to get the Romans to destroy my people. A tzaddik he isn't. And you're telling me that <clears throat> Hashem is so concerned for the embarrassment of this man that if it could be Hashem burns down the base of Migdash? Question number one is, what is in fact the cause of the destruction of the base of Migdash? Question number two is, why does Hashem get so, excuse my expression, bent out of shape over this man's embarrassment? And how embarrassing was it? And to answer this question, I think we need to focus on things a little bit differently. And to do that, <clears throat> let me share with you the following example. Imagine you're on the scene when you see Ruvain pull out a gun, point it directly at Shimon and says, you are a bleep, 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 and I'm going to kill you. And you say to Ruvain, don't do it, don't do it. And your friend next to you says, don't do it, Ruvain, what are you doing? Ruvain says, I don't care, but Basin's going to kill you. We'll take you to Basin, no, I don't care. You can be Chaimis, I don't care. Pow, pow, pow. Shoots Shimon dead. Shimon falls into a puddle of blood. You and your friend go to Basin. Sanhedrin of 23, and they hear your witnesses, they hear your testimony, and they dorish, they ask you questions back and forth. In fact, they are convinced that he murdered them, and they're about to paschimista, they're about to send him to his death. At which point, Ruvain looks to the <coughs> Beisden and says, Rabbis, may I approach the bench? You know? He walks over and says, are you uh, all Jewish? Yeah, we are. Are, are you Orthodox? Yeah. Do you believe in the Rambam? Yeah, what do you want? Doesn't the Rambam say, Borei Umanhig, Hashem is the creator and one who runs the world? He alone orchestrates every activity on the planet. Don't you believe that? Of course we believe it, so what do you want? To which Ruvain says, what do you want from me? Obviously, God wanted him dead or I couldn't have touched him. What do you want from me? If anything, I did God's wishes, I did God's bidding, you should give me a reward for following the decree of God. Don't you believe? <clears throat> so my friends, what's the answer to this question? The Rambam in Hilchus Chuv explains to us the answer. He says, Ruvain got it 100% correct, except for missing a little detail. You see, on Rosh Hashanah, when Hashem decrees who will live and who will die, Hashem <clears throat> judges every single human being on the planet. And if, in fact, Shimon was given a decree for life, there ain't nothing that you or I or anyone else is going to do to change that. But let's, in fact, assume that that year Shimon was decreed to death. It could also be that Hashem will decree that certain people, for certain reasons of things they did before, will be allowed to be there on the scene, and they'll be allowed to pull the trigger on the gun. If they don't do it, Shimon will die in a violent death through some other means. He'll be hit by lightning, he'll be hit by a car, something will happen. But it often occurs, says the Rambam, that Hashem will allow certain human beings for other reasons, other things they've done, to be there and to be given the free choice. And if, in fact, Ruvain is the man on the scene, and if, in fact, he pulls the trigger on that gun, he is the murderer of Shimon for all intents and purposes, for all <clears throat> judgments. He is the murderer, even though it's true that had he not killed Shimon, Shimon would have hit, been hit by a car, hit by a tree, hit by lightning. Shimon would have died, but to allow for free will, to allow for reward and punishment, Hashem will allow certain people to be the one to pull the trigger on the gun. And if you do, you are the murderer. 100% held accountable totally and completely. Would you like to know the answer to what was the cause of the destruction of Ace Migdash? The answer is all these reasons and none of these reasons, meaning to say Hashem decreed that it's appropriate and proper for the base of Migdash to be destroyed. As the Gemara Yuma tells us, because it was Sinaschinim, that was the underlying reason. And that event was to happen. 
Nevertheless, Hashem allows things to play out in a particular way to allow for free will, to allow for reward and punishment. Bar Kamsa is held accountable. He is called the one who destroyed the base of Migdash because of his machinations, because of his plot, because of his causing the Romans to rebel and to <clears throat> attack the Jewish people. Because of that, he is called the murderer of all of those people. And for all intents and purposes, he's Chayev. And I dare say on some level, Rabbi Zechariah ben Avukalos also is Chayev. When you're in a position of authority, when you're in that position of power and you call the shot wrong, Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but you are the one who is held accountable. And I think this concept is fundamental to understanding life. When you read about a seven-year-old being hit by a car, when you hear about a 12-year-old in front of the son who dies, when you read about a baby who did nothing in his life, right or wrong, six-month-old, you have to understand there's a lot more going on behind the scenes that we don't understand. And the biggest part of that is understanding that every human being is given a life setting. And every human being is given an exact life setting with certain strengths, certain talents, certain abilities put into a certain generation, into a certain birth order, and given a life. And their entire life is mapped out how many years they have to live and what events will befall them. All of it is mapped out, all of it is there. And there's only one thing that you're given credit for, your choices. Choosing right, choosing wrong. If you made a billion dollars, it had nothing to do with you. You know, brighter than the next guy, you know, smarter than the next guy. I've been around enough years to find out that some of the wealthiest people I know are not that bright. And I don't mean it disparagingly, it's a reality. I was a high school Rebbe for 15 years, and my guys are now at the stage where they're <clears throat> in life already. And I had quite a number of guys who are hugely successful, you phenomenally, as in like 4,000 employees, as in like buying the city. And I can tell you, as their Rebbe, no brighter, in fact, not even of the brightest of the group. And it's not one or two, it's a number of guys. And plenty of brilliant fellows, savvy, sharp, popular, every th talent, barely able to eke out a living. And it doesn't take that long of kicking around his life to realize that Hashem meets out exact life circumstances, how talented, how smart, how pretty you are. All of it has nothing to do with you. There's only one thing they ask you when you're done your job here. <clears throat> what did you do with the strength you were given, your talents? What were your choices? And as every human being has a life setting, <clears throat> so too does each generation. I had the opportunity to speak at my son's bar mitzvah. It was a number of years ago by now. And at my son's bar mitzvah, I told him the story of a little Sefer Torah, a small Sefer Torah. The story went like this. <clears throat> Rabbi Shmuel Dasberg saw this young boy, Yochem Yachim, who was uh, close to bar mitzvah age, he was 12 something. So he said to Yochem Yosef, I want you to lane for your bar mitzvah. And Yoachim Yosef refused. He didn't want to learn how to read. He didn't want to learn to lane. He had wanted nothing to do with it. Rabbi Dasberg was very persistent. Again and again, he told him again and again. He asked him. And finally, Yoachim Yosef agrees to learn how to lane. And in fact, Yoachim Yosef laned his bar mitzvah parsha in Bergen-Belsen, in the concentration camp. You see, Rabbi Shmuel Dasberg had smuggled in when he was brought into the camps. He smuggled in this very small Sefer Torah. He saw this boy, Joachim Yosef, who was close to bar mitzvah age. And under <clears throat> Nazi <clears throat> guard, without them obviously being aware, this 13-year-old <clears throat> boy read his bar mitzvah parsha, made the brachas, and they quickly dispatched the minion before they were murdered for doing what they were doing. But before they dispatched, <clears throat> Redasberg said, but I have one more request from you, Joachim. I want you to take this Sefer Torah. I want you to take it with you. And Yochim Yosef says, me, I'm a little boy, how can I do it? Red Dasberg says, you don't understand, I'm an old man, I don't think I'm gonna make it out of here. I want you to take the Sefer Torah and I want you to promise me that the whole world will hear about it. Red Dasberg persisted and in fact, Yochim Yosef took that Sefer Torah. He survived and he ended up in Israel and he put that small Sefer Torah in a cabinet where it remained for years. Many decades later, Ilon Ramon, the Israeli astronaut, was consulting with Dr. Joachim Yosef on some issues related to 
<clears throat> the scientific quest. Ilan Ramon was an astronaut. He was going up on the Columbia, one of the few <clears throat> joint space probes. And he had certain issues he needed to discuss with Dr. Yosef. So in his apartment, <clears throat> Ilan Ramon is discussing with Dr. Yosef. And when they were finished, the conversation turned to the small Sefer Torah that was in the cabinet. And Ilan Ramon asked Dr. Joachim Yosef if he could take it up with him. And in fact, he did. <clears throat> that Sefer Torah went up on the Columbia. Unfortunately, it was a tragic ending when on the re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, it ex the capsule exploded into flame. But that promise made 57 years earlier was fulfilled because the entire world learned about that Sefer Torah. The reason why I wanted my son to hear this story at his bar mitzvah because of one point, I said to him as follows, did Joachim Yosef choose to be born in Poland in 1920? Did he say to Hashem, Hashem, Bergen-Belsen sounds like the ideal place for my bar mitzvah. I just love the setting. The venue is just so perfect. He didn't choose. And none of us get to choose. You did not choose to be born into the generation you were born. You did not choose the body, the mind. You did not choose the temperament that you have. And you have to understand that every generation has what I call a life test. Each individual has strengths, talents, and is held to a certain standard. Each individual person has their life test but each generation has its life test as well. And the question is, what is the life test of our generation? What is the battlefront? Where is the battle in our times? And let's face it, we have money, freedom, opportunity. Yeshivas, we're in a public setting over here. Turn anytime, blast us over the internet throughout the world. You can learn Torah, you can do mitzvahs, you have everything at your disposal. There are no nisyonos in our generation. There are no tests. What's the test of our generation? So, if you don't know the answer to this question, I'll share with you what I believe the answer to this question is. I'm not that old, but I have witnessed in front of my eyes such a fast destruction of civilization, such a speedy decline in morality, ethics, and decency that it's flabbergasting. It's so beyond expression. And when I talk to younger people about declining morality, and they look at me like, what are you talking about? What do you mean? I have to say, you don't get it? No, what do you mean, Rabbi? What, what, what do you mean? So in case you don't get it, <clears throat> let me sort of share with you. I grew up in America <clears throat> in the early, I guess the 60s, we'll call it. Let's go back 10 years before that. America in the 1950s was happy days. A man got married to a woman. They bought a house in the suburbs with a white picket fence. They had 1.5 kids and a dog. He remained married to she for their life. He went to work every day, came home every night, and they lived their life. If you compare the life of America in the 1950s to the life of Americans today, I think there's very little basis of comparison. The breakdown of the family is astonishing. 50% divorce rate. But that's assuming they get married, which is not so posh anymore. Utter disrespect for parents, for teachers. The type of words that in a million years you wouldn't say. I was a wild kid growing up. I wouldn't dream of saying the kind of things, oh, my, my wife doesn't hear that, my kids say to me. Forget whether my father would have touched me. Yeah, he would have, by the way. And my father did. I was not an abused child, but my brother and I, we got it, but good. And we knew very well that we deserved it. But no one was damaged. <clears throat> no one was an abused child. And if you think I got it bad, you should have seen my friends, man, their parents. Woo! And you didn't open your mouth to a parent because you got smacked. I got abused. My mom. Where do you go? You got abused. You're right. Go tell your teacher. My parents smacked me. They're abusing you. Teacher will smack you. <laughs> you touched my kid. You touched my child. Oh, I hope you did. You hit him hard enough. But I have to tell you, it's it's 
it's hard for me to even, you know, all right, how am I going to do this? How am I going to explain to you America of the 50s and America today? Here's the simplest way. Don't do this. Don't go on the internet because it's damaging and destructive. But if you do, go to YouTube and watch any situation comedy, any program from the 1950s, anything. And you know what you're going to see? Intact families, respect for parents, children doing what they should do, and you will see, obviously, excuse my little pair, no sexual innuendos, nothing like that. There's nothing. It's so clean. Would you like to know how clean it, was? it is? When we were first married, in a little while, I went to my in-laws' house for Shabbos, and uh, some, the conversation uh, came up, and I mentioned, well, we can't do that because my wife is pregnant. Later on, my wife explained to me that that was a faux pas. It was a boo-boo. I should never say the word pregnant at the table. Why? My father-in-law, Zechon of Rachel, learned by Rav Aaron Cutler, and it was a high level of sneers. To say the word pregnant at the table wasn't considered sneers. Now, I didn't know what my wife was talking about. I didn't, whatever, that's the rule. That's fine. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I love Lucy in the late 50s, actually early 60s, featured Lucy Ricardo, who was then played by Lucille Ball, she gave birth to little Ricky. For seven weeks, she was pregnant on the show, and the word pregnant was not mentioned because it would have offended the listeners. Do you know, little, leave it to Beaver, you guys don't know this, but there was, here, one second. In 1927, when the FCC was first started, they made rules because the radio waves were a frightening concept. Any person from anywhere in the country could blurt out who knows what. So the FCC made rules controlling things. In 1931, the U.S. Circuit Appeals <clears throat> brought Robert Duncan to court. They sued him and found him guilty of obscenities on the airwaves. You know what the words he said was? Excuse me, saying it, he said, damned. And he said the word, by God, irreverently. And because he said, by God, as like an expression, like, by God, you'll blah, 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 he was brought to court, sued, fined, and you couldn't speak that way. And if you look at any movie that Hollywood put out <clears throat> until 1967, you'll find incredibly clean language. Why? Because they would have been sued out of their, they would have been wiped out. Because there were controls, but by the way, it didn't even need didn't even need the FCC. There was a code of decency that the movie <clears throat> board kept in place. They would stay away with what they called good taste and delicacy, and being very careful. By the way, Ed Sullivan show. If you know what the Ed Sullivan show was from the old times, Ed Sullivan made the the Beatles. In 1957, Ed Sullivan brought Elvis Presley onto stage, but here was the problem. How do you broadcast this into America's home? How do you put this into the living rooms of the regular man, woman, and child? The cameramen were given strict orders. Elvis can only be filmed from the waist up because his motions are so inappropriate that the average man, woman, or child in America cannot be exposed to that type of thing. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> that's not the state of affairs today. I'm not going to get involved into what's shown <clears throat> on the uh, airwaves of TV. But let, actually, let's go back to 2005, by the way. You know, like 100 years ago, like last, you know, <clears throat> last millennium. Um, <clears throat> 2005, so they did the following study. The average child <clears throat> watching TV, by the time he has graduated elementary school, will have witnessed 8,000 murders and over 100,000 other acts of violence. By the time that child is 18 years of age, he or she will have witnessed 200,000 acts of violence, including 40,000 murders. But that's not the real problem. The problem is the graphicness with which they illustrate it. When Rolling Stone magazine, now Rolling Stone magazine, I don't know if you read, and you shouldn't read it if you do, but it is not the heights of virtue. It's not what you bring into the base medrash. Their critique in 2005 is, and the prime time network and basic tele cable television has such a bloodthirsty procedural kinds of thrillers that it's the most violent, sadistic t TV, season, t TV season ever, and series and scenes that should not be shown to regular men. Rolling Stone magazine 
critiques the average ABC, NBC, CBS regular programming then of primetime TV and says it's abhorrent. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was a decade ago. Now, we don't watch TV because we understand the damage, but <clears throat> no one watches TV anymore because it's all accessible, all available on the internet. But what is accessible? What is available? And what happens? And what do you see? So I'd like to explain to you my take on it. Jane Goodall was a primatologist. She studied apes. And she's a fascinating writer. Because for 30 years, she lived in the jungle. And when I say she studied monkeys and apes, I mean she lived there with the troops, with the baboons, with the various primates. And she was there. And she describes their entire life cycle. She was with them. And you could see pictures. She was very, she used to talk to them, whatever that means. And when you read her book, you get an eye glimpse into the mind of a monkey, the mind of an ape. And when you turn on reality TV, that's exactly what you see. <laughs> when you turn on reality TV, what you're looking at is abnormal. It's absurd, it's obscene. I can't say it's bad behavior. It's such selfish, loudish. <clears throat> I can't describe how ugly and stupid it is. I'm not even talking about morality. I'm talking about self-centered, nasty, backbiting, the kind of thing that your mother would tell you, ugh. And the kind of thing that if there was a government in charge would say this is abhorrent, this is damaging to children. What happens when a young child watches Tens of thousands of acts of cohabitation. That's a polite way of saying znus, um, sexual connections. And one out of seven of those are between a husband and his wife. And what are the six out of seven of those 10,000 and more acts? I'll leave it to your imagination, and it doesn't take much to imagine. But when little Peter, Bob, and Sally at six and seven years of age are exposed to this. And when on a nightly basis or a daily basis on their iPhone or wherever, they're watching people pull out guns and shooting other people. And the camera takes you right into the guts to see the blood, the gore. And I can't even read some of these words. I don't watch this stuff, guys, I'll be honest with you. But when I read the words, I can't read much of this stuff out loud. It's so gory and so abhorrent but it's primetime TV, or now anything's primetime because it's on the internet. It's right there. So what happens to a culture when it's bombarded, constantly assailed with ugliness, selfishness, abhorrent, creepy behavior? And folks, it's not like for a couple of minutes a day. In the old country, that's 2005, in the old country, <clears throat> the average American elementary school kid watched 25 hours of TV a week. Today, it's way, way more. The attachment to the palm of your hand with that little device is constant. It's ubiquitous. It's always there. And when you're assailed with such filth and such ugliness and such horrific scenes, what happens to your sense of morality? And what happens to your sense of the world? What happens to your sense of relationships? What happens to your sense of marriage? What happens to your sense of dedication? Could it be? Could it be that it erodes it slightly? Is it possible that the average child growing up in America today exposed to this stuff does not have the same viewpoint of life as did a boy growing up in the 50s? You're not sure, huh? You don't know. So let's take a criteria that might be indicative. How are you feeling today? Feeling good? Hope you're not feeling too good. It's Tisha Bobby supposed to be unhappy. And it's OK for you to be fundamentally unhappy today. But what if your state of being all year round is depressed or anxious, <clears throat> nervous, unsettled? What if you are so unsettled that you can't function in life? So it's unfortunate we get your help. We get you to the right counselor. Maybe we get your medication if it's called for, and we put you back together. 2005 was a big year, folks. That was a year that antidepressants took number one spot. 
the most prescribed class of medication in the country. Let's have a big round of applause for the SSRI group. Big money raiser for all the pharmaceutical companies. Now folks, don't get me wrong. When it's called for and it's appropriate, medication is proper, and I tell many, many people to go, and it's fine. But when you're talking about 118 million prescriptions a year, back in the old country, 2005, remember the last, back then? Where's it at today? See, I got the numbers for you. Total number of people taking psychiatric drugs in the United States of America, here we go. Antidepressants, 41 million. Antipsychotics, 6 million, 800,045. Anti-anxiety, anti -anxiety, 36 million. Grand total of 78 million, 694,000 people in this country are unable to function without psychotropic medication. Folks, how many people in this country? I'll give you 312, 316, I don't know exactly. We're talking over 25% cannot function. Well, it's always been that way, right? Uh, no, uh-uh, it's never been that way. Ain't never been that way. The reported cases of depression have multiplied by a factor of 10, but it's everything. It's every imaginable disorder and every imaginable issue. Anorexia didn't exist when I was a kid. Cutting, cutting, cutting. You know what cutting means? You're in such pain. You're in such pain that the only way you can alleviate the pain is by cutting yourself so that pain distracts you. Now, I was a wild kid, and the idea of causing people pain made sense to me. Other people, not me. But we're talking good girls from good families. We're talking a generation that's so emotionally, psychologically unhealthy and unbalanced that it's frightening. I get the calls all the time. And folks, again, don't go in the internet. But whatever you read, the really incredible stuff that you know can't really be, I get the phone calls from, from people who got that issue. And I want to share with you, if you want to know the test of the generation, a half of it, but it's only a half, a half of it is the incredibly unhealthy environment that you and I live in. And the propagation of the media, the media is everywhere. You can't breathe, you can't look. Get on your iPhone, pull it out, come on, let's go. Get on right now, come on, let's go. Anybody wanna, come on, guys, pull it out, you got it, come on, it's been over. By the way, how long can you stand without taking it out of your pocket? You wanna know how long? <coughs> C-H-E-C-K-Y, it's an app for Android, they have other ones for the other phone, what's that other phone? The Oh, iPhone, yeah. So if you guys are iPhone fans, there's an app for that. And you put that app on, and it shows you, number one, how many times a day you check your phone. And when you see the number 200, 200, 200 times a day? We're talking like 10 times an hour, but that's if you're up 20 hours a day. But if you're only up 12 hours, oh my goodness. And you're talking about people who rack it up to 300? But just one second, what are you saying? Same thing. Same thing. All right. So if you want to know part of what's wrong with this generation, part of the Nisoyen, the test of our generation, part of it is the fact that there's so much unhealthiness, so much psychological <clears throat> unbalance, much to do with the media, much to do with the culture, but that's only a small part of it. If you'd like to know the rest of the equation, we have to go back. You see, we had two questions. One question was, why did Hashem destroy the base of Migdash? The Gemara told us it was Rabbi Zechariah. Then the Gemara told us Sinas Chinam. And also the Gemara told us Bar Kamsa. And the answer to that question, I believe we understand, and that is that Hashem runs the world. And Hashem decreed that the base of Migdash was going to be destroyed because of Sinas Chinam, a baseless hatred. But Hashem allows certain people to be on the scene of the crime. And Hashem allows certain people to pull a trigger on the gun. And I get that. But what I don't understand is the second question. Bo Urei, come see, Kamakasha Koahabusha, how powerful embarrassment is. Do you want to see how bad it is, how devastating it is to embarrass a fellow Jew in public? Shehechriv is Beso, Hashem destroyed his house. See it as Barkamsa, Hashem helped Barkamsa and destroyed his house. Why? Because how could I watch the embarrassment of that man? How could I watch him be publicly booshed out? I can't stand that. I'm going to help him, says Akadosh Baruch Hu, destroy the base of Mikdash. This guy who's the Russia who's going to <clears throat> tell on the Romans, destroy his people. This one, Hashem, what's pshat? So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know the answer to this question, what you have to do is you have to think <clears throat> like a Jew. 
And unfortunately, so much of what we see and so much of what we're exposed to is the opposite. If you want to think like a Jew, I'll share with you one simple observation. Imagine you open your eyes and you see a beautiful world, complete, trees, oceans, rivers. You see the sky, you see the sun, you see birds and you see animals. You are Adam Arishon. You are the first man in creation and you are alone in this world. No other human being occupying this planet. You are the sole person. And then you hear a Bosco, God himself say, Lo tov yosa Adam levado. It is not good for man to be alone. It's not good for him. Esalo is a connecto, I'm going to make for him a helpmate. And Hashem creates Chava. And the brisk Rav says, wait a minute, stop the film. Something's wrong here. Adam is alone. Of course Hashem has to make Chava. The purpose of creation is the human race. <clears throat> One man alone is not the human race. Why does the Pasuk say? Because it's not good for him. He needs to help me. That's why I'm going to make Chava. You need Chava for a much more basic reason. You can have the human people without a man and a woman. And says Briskarov, you missed the boat. Hashem created the entire cosmos, a hundred billion galaxies, each containing a hundred billion stars, and <clears throat> created the earth as the center purpose of it all. The pivot of it all, the reason of it all was one man, and Hashem was ready to say, enough. Everything in creation is right there. All of it is worthy, and all of it's appropriate for this man. However, it's not good for man to be alone. And therefore, says Hashem, I'm going to create Chava. I'm going to create the rest of the world. But says the Brisker Rob, don't you get it? If you want to know the value of a single human being, no one understands that Hashem would have created the entire world, everything that it contains for one human being. And that's what the Mishnah teaches us. Chayev Adam Lomar, a human being, a man, a person is obligated to say, Bishfili Nivra Olam. Hashem didn't create the world by happenstance. And Hashem didn't create the world without an order. Hashem made man alone originally for every one of us to learn the lesson that I too am a man, and Hashem would have felt fit to create the entire world for me and me alone. Would you like to know the answer to why Hashem helped Bar Kamsa? A human being, the reason for creation is embarrassed publicly? Do you know what it means? He turns red, he turns white, like you killed him. Do you understand the pain? Do you know how valuable he is? Says Hashem, I'm going to destroy the base of Middash because that's right, that's appropriate, that's proper. Do you know what it means to embarrass a man? To embarrass a person in public? Do you understand what you've done? Says Hashem, look at the scale. This equals that. It's worthy to destroy the base of Middash. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know what's wrong with our generation, <clears throat> I believe that that is it. Every person, 20 and under today, nothing personal, guys, any you people under 20, has such a chip on their shoulder, such a sense of entitlement, <clears throat> such a sense of me, me, me. They use the word narcissistic. I don't even know what it means anymore. But and the sense of it's going to come to me in big time, easily, or forget it, because I'm deservant of it. And you probably don't know what I'm talking about. But let me share with you a code of conduct. And this was in my day. If you read Boy's Life, which was like Boy Scouts magazine, there was a code of conduct. And it's written all over. Take out a YouTube. Don't take it out. But if you go to YouTube and watch anything from the late 50s, the early 60s, you could feel the code of conduct. And these are the words. To be a man means that you're brave, loyal, and true. When you're wrong, you own up to it and take your punishment. You don't take advantage of women. As a husband, you support and protect your wife and children. You're gracious in victory and a good sport in defeat. Your word is your bond. Your handshake is as good as your word. It's not whether you win or lose, but how you play the game. When the ship goes down, you put the women and children into the lifeboats and wave goodbye with a smile. Ladies and gentlemen, I challenge you to watch any reality TV program today and find me that code of conduct. I challenge you to watch anything the media puts out there and find a human being acting with dignity, with a sense of self, with a sense of self-worth. 
You don't know what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking to myself, right? Right? Okay, fine. You don't know what I'm talking about? Here, I'll make it as clear as I can. Imagine the following. You're in the psychiatrist's office. You're a fly on the wall, and you witness. In walks a man stark naked. Stark naked. Painted brown, head to toe. Fully painted. With a huge, giant fish hook in his mouth. He says, doctor, 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 I'm a worm, I'm a worm, I'm a worm. The fish are going to eat me, the fish are going to eat me. Doctor, 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 help me. The psychiatrist sits back. <clears throat> Hmm, how long do you have this problem? Uh, doc, I've always been a worm. I've been a worm. The fish are going to eat me. Doc, help me, help me, help me. You have a problem. I know, Doc, help me. The doctor says, fine, I can cure you. Reaches under his desk, <clears throat> pulls out a shovel. Fella, there's a big yard outside. Dig a hole and climb in there because then you'll feel better. You'll feel comfortable. You'll feel in your element and you'll feel better, okay? That's $450. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> excuse me for saying this. In the world today, <clears throat> there's an entire alphabet, an entire alphabet of issues, problems, and troubles. And by the way, <clears throat> if this is recorded, I could lose my, <clears throat> I could lose my license. I could be not, never allowed to practice rabbinics again for this. However, <clears throat> the rabbinical board, <clears throat> to my knowledge, does not censor us for this stuff. Here we go: L G B T Q R S T U V D E W X O Y N Z. Now I know my ABCs. There's 60 of them. Go to Amazon, there are 60 listings for how I identify, how I view myself. That's who I am. I found myself. When you show up in a doctor's office and you say you're a worm, the doctor should say, fella, let's get it together, guy. Why don't you try a little uh, transformative surgery? Why don't you try some drugs that maybe, you know, make you from a man into a woman? You'll be happy then, right? And strange enough, there's a, a, a higher suicide rate when they go through the mu body mutilation than, than before. I don't get it. Why? I should like to know why, ladies and gentlemen. LGBTQ, whatever it is, is not a lifestyle. And it is not an orientation. It's an assignment. It's a test. If I have a temper, my job in life is to work on my temper. And I can't just say to heck, will you pop, punch anybody I want? And if I'm a married man, I have to train myself to have eyes for my wife. And I can't just, whatever, because I feel I had a feeling. I had a feeling, so I went, you know, so this woman now, you know. And so, too, I will grant you, it is a rather strange generation. When I was a boy, <clears throat> growing up, this stuff did not exist. But it was a different world back then. <clears throat> and there are people who have issues, orientation issues, and et cetera, and it is a reality. And that reality is no different than if you have a temper, if you have jealousy, if you have any sort of issue that we human beings will put on the planet to work on. And saying it's a lifestyle, <clears throat> saying it's an orientation, and making it all permitted <clears throat> is uh, pretty destructive. And maybe you'll say, <clears throat> but that's only just a couple of people, and it's just some nudniks over here. So just to set the record straight, <clears throat> and I want you to understand this clearly, there is <clears throat> a movement today, <clears throat> it is called the, um, it's actually not that no, new already, it's almost eight, nine years old. Um, it is called the Man-Boy Love Association, the North American Man-Boy Love Association. Their goal <clears throat> is to make it not just permitted, but you have to understand what this is. These are words. I hate to say these words. I'm going to read it publicly. Excuse my nivel pep. <clears throat> if you advocate for gay rights, you should understand the relationship with an older man is precisely what any 13, 14, or 15-year-old kid needs more than anything else in the world. And they're trying to pass laws and make it <clears throat> permitted to to be predators on 13, 14, and 15 year old boys. But that doesn't trouble you. You know what should trouble you? Intergenerational romance. Oh, that's nice. Romance. Romance. And intergenerational. That's so romantic. Do you know what intergenerational romance means? It means when a 40 year old decides that a six year old girl is his romantic choice. And if you think that I'm just kidding, <clears throat> I'd like to share with you that there's a group before you act, and they have conferences. <clears throat> and at the conference, they believe that adults' desire to have sex with children is normative. Normative means normal. Um, these things are not black and white, the various grades of shades. Pedophilia should be removed as a mental disorder from the American Psychiatric Association, from the DSM, just like <clears throat> um, other disorders were removed in 1973. What, what are those disorders? I know what they are. <clears throat> um, the DSM ignores the fact that pedophiles have feelings of love and romance for children in the same way adults love one another. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I should be embarrassed to read those words in public. I should vomit. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? The world gets it 100% backwards. Everything they think they have control of, they have no control over. You don't have control over how wealthy you're going to be. You don't have control over your generation that you choose. The only issue you have control over is your choices, who you are as a human being, how careful you are with what you say, how much you make yourself into a mensch, how careful you are with other people's feelings. The only control you have is over you. You have no control over life circumstances. And I think this Chazal shares with us a powerful understanding. When Hashem decreed that the base of Mikdash was to be destroyed, Hashem still allowed free will. And if Zechariah could be the man in the right place, but at the wrong time, and make the call wrong, and on some level he's considered responsible, he was too humble. They should have killed this Bar Kamsa. And because this Bar Kamsa was trying to cause a rebellion, he should have been annihilated. And because Rabbi Zechariah acted incorrectly, he's responsible. And Bar Kamsa is a murderer of a million plus people in 2,000 years of exile <clears throat> because of this man. Aye, but it would have happened anyway? Exactly. When Ruvain holds the gun to Shimon, he has to be fully aware that if Hashem decreed Shimon to live, there's nothing he's going to do to change that decree. But if, in fact, he succeeds, it doesn't mean he changed anything. We human beings, we think we're so powerful, we think we're in charge, we control nothing. But Hashem allows us to be the person, and if I'm the one to pull the trigger on the gun, and he falls dead, for all intents and purposes, I am the murderer. And the opposite is true as well. If you start an organization, and it flourishes. If you start, and I'm going to do a plug because I can't resist. If Torah anytime becomes an international sensation, because one man says, this is too valuable, we have Rabbanim giving Shurim, and no one's doing anything about it, I'm going to make a difference, and he single-handedly changes so much of the Jewish nation, that one man got very, very lucky. Very lucky. He bought himself an Olam Haba that's hard to imagine. So it's him, right? It's him. It has nothing to do with him, but it has everything to do with him. For whatever which reason, Hashem gifted him, Hashem allowed him to be the man on the scene, he pulled the trigger and all of it's credited to him. And I say the same for Chazak, and this is not a plug because they don't pay my salary, believe me. <clears throat> but <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, it's a beautiful thing to watch. We're living in a time when you could accomplish so much. But what you have to do is you have to shut off the static, the noise of the media. And the biggest message that you have to shut off is that you're a worm, you're a slime, you're a worthless nothing. And if you open any device, including even an Android, and you watch it, especially during a shear, I love it when guys, they're in the shear, they love you. <clears throat> and if you're watching, by the way, I got something to look at, I got my grandchildren, baby girls, isn't that nice? So I understand why I pull out a little shit, because they're cute. But do you understand this one pervasive message that you're going to hear from any media portal? And that is you're a slime, you're worthless, you cannot actually make yourself into anything. You're a worm. Don't fight. Don't challenge yourself because your self-esteem will get damaged. they? You're good. You're okay. You're better than you're good, 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 good. Get into the dirt. Here's the here's the here's Here's the shovel. Climb around a little bit. Feel good? Feel good? Good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you a secret. That's not the way to become great. Hashem created this world with a purpose. And Hashem gave each of us a life setting. And Hashem gave the generation a life setting as well. In this generation, you could rise up. You could become great. You could grow. You could accomplish. You could change the essence of you. But the biggest fight is understanding who you can be. Understanding that you can really set goals. Understanding that you can challenge yourself and you're going to fall down, but you get back in again. And when you fall down, you don't buy into the message. See, they were right. I really am a worm. Let me get that brown paint and put it all over me. But you're fighting an uphill battle. And I got one last thing to say. What if you would like to learn a foreign language? Many of you people speak two languages. I met a gentleman had him at my Shabbos table. He spoke seven languages. Let's say you decide you want to learn another language called French, Spanish. <clears throat> How much time would it take you? So most people, <clears throat> reasonably intelligent, reasonably diligent, two hours a day for two years, they'll have good command of language. Okay. Let's say you decide you want to learn a musical instrument. You play the guitar, piano, 
trumpet. How long did it take? Average person, normal talents, two hours a day for two years, and you have a pretty decent command of the instrument. You'll play nicely. Want to learn some Torah? <clears throat> two hours a day, two years, you'll be fine. This device <clears throat> that's in 100% of your pocket, by the way, 18 to 20 year olds, 18 to 30 year olds now, 92%. So <clears throat> some of you may not have this device, but for the rest of us to do, I personally guarantee if you put an app on your phone to watch the time you spend on it, you waste way over two hours. I almost guarantee you spend three to four hours because that's the average. But I guarantee you that two hours of those minimally two hours give you nothing. Oh, you want to go on Facebook to see that, oh, you went to the gym, you had oatmeal and raisins before you went, wow. Oh, and I just love looking at you on vacation and you with your kids and your kids are always smiling, always behaving, and my kids are, oh, okay. So <clears throat> all the good that you're going to get, I guarantee more than two hours a day are totally, utterly wasted. And you know what you could do with those two hours a day? Forget the guitar and forget the French lessons. <clears throat> but you could actually set real goals, you could actually learn, you want to tour anytime, <clears throat> go to Shear, set realistic goals, you put them in writing, and give up this addiction. But put the app on your phone, you'll never believe it. On the Android, it's C H E C K Y, Checky, put it on. On the iPhone, you gotta look it up, put on uh, what do you call it, time monitoring app or whatever. <clears throat> go, is, does anyone know? Moment. Moment is one of them, okay. And you'll be shocked out of your reality. 300 times a day, <clears throat> two and a half hours, three hours, four hours. What if you rack up 10 hours a day? What if it says you're on it 10 hours a day? What does that mean? It means you're 15 years of age or younger. Because the average 15 year old or younger today spends in excess of eight, 10 hours a day on their device. I think this Gemara is sharing with us a profound concept. <clears throat> Number one, Hashem created the world and runs the world, and Hashem gives each generation a life test. <clears throat> the power that the human being has is very limited. <clears throat> Rabbi Zechariah was held guilty. Bar Kamsa is held guilty. None of them were the real reason. The real reason is baseless hatred. That's our job to work on. But the more <clears throat> pointed lesson for us is the second point that Hashem felt the embarrassment, the pain of Bar Kamsa to such extent that Hashem said it's worthy to destroy the base of Mikdash itself. Do you know what it means to embarrass a man? And if you want to know the value of a single human being, listen to the words of this Gemara. That's God saying <clears throat> the base of Mikdash should be destroyed for one man's embarrassment, and that man's a Russia. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter what you think of yourself, you're not worse than Bar Kamsa. And that means <clears throat> that you have worth and you have to set goals. And I want to close with one last step. As soon as the Caesar heard that the Jews were rebelling, he sent Neron Kaiser. Neron was a Caesar that he sent, the battle general, and the general <clears throat> launches into Eretz Yisrael with his armies, <clears throat> entire soldiers, and before he attacks Yerushalayim, he wants to see whether he's going to succeed. And <clears throat> so Gemara tells us he shoots an arrow, and the arrow miraculously flies straight to Yerushalayim. He shoots an arrow in this direction, and in midair, it turns around and flies to your shalayim. He shoots an arrow in this direction, any direction he shoots it and it flies straight to your shalayim. And finally, he stops a little child in the street and asks him, what pasuk did you learn today in yeshiva? And the boy says, the pasuk I learned was, Nasasit nikmasi be'edom, I'm going to give my revenge against Edom, be'ad ami Yisrael. The Jewish people are going to have my, the opportunity to take revenge for what Edom is gonna do. Says Neron, the Caesar of Rome, Hashem wants to destroy his house. <clears throat> and he wants to wipe his hands on me. He got it. He saw through the veil. He realized that Hashem wanted to destroy the base of Migdash, and he realized that he was going to be the whipping boy, that Hashem was going to come demand punishment from him. Says the Gemara, he ran away. Was Megayar, became a convert, and from him came Reb Meir. And when you could see through the dust, the static, the noise, and understand you have a chance to grow. And this generation we live in is unique, that you could accomplish, you could reach the stars. There's a lot pulling you down. But if you set your goals, hold your sight, Hashem helps. The God of grant you much success. We spend, celebrate the next event in Yishlam of New York.